Uh, urinary stone disease um, uh, it covers a number of different um, anatomical areas. So if your stone is formed in the kidney, it's called a kidney stone. If it's in the ureter, it's a ureteric stone. If it's in the bladder, it's a bladder stone. But actually, the causes are the same. And these are um, crystallizations of the urine into stone aggregates or crystal aggregates. Um, they vary from very soft to very hard stones, and they vary in the problems they cause patients from the most excruciating pain patients can experience when a stone passes from the kidney into the ureter, through to terrible bladder pain or kidney pain with the stones, all the way through to actually no symptoms at all. And increasingly with the number of images patients are having performed for a number of other conditions, we're finding um, incidental stones. In other words, stones that aren't causing any problems for anybody at all, but they're picked up on imaging. Um, the other symptoms that they can cause is blood in the urine, urinary infection. And if you're un unlucky enough to suffer stones in each kidney or in both ureters, of course, they can impact on the kidney and give you kidney impairment problems. Uh, well, the most important part is the is the story, is the history, and that's the um, information the patient provides us. And in 90% of the patients, we will probably be able to establish a, a working diagnosis from the story alone. We then supplement that with um, tests. One of the most important tests, we do a urine test. So we look for trace of blood in the urine. We look for evidence of infection. Um, we use blood tests to see if there's any predisposing factor for stone disease, such as an elevated calcium or uric acid in the blood. And finally, we're very reliant on our uroradiology colleagues with their imaging technology. And we use anything from plain old fashioned x-ray through to the most high tech, low dose CT and sometimes MR, um, MRI imaging to help us um, establish the diagnosis and to look at the kidney function, how well the kidneys are responding to those stones. Well, we could speak forever on this subject, but um, the majority of kidney stones actually we don't need to treat if they're not causing any problems. They're tiny and they're picked up on instant. Uh, they're picked up as incidental findings. Then these patients don't need treatment, but perhaps monitoring. But obviously, if they're causing problems or we feel that they're going to cause problems in the future because of their size and location, then we would offer treatment for those stones. And those treatments vary from the use of an extraordinary technology called extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, where we use shockwaves focused from the outside onto the stone to fragment the stone into pieces, which the patient can subsequently pass. And we're blessed with the with access to fantastic lithotripsy in London, and we have very good results from that. So, and that's a great option for patients, non-invasive, outpatient, no anaesthetic. We then have available to us um, a, a whole gamut of endoscopic treatments. Um, and we tend to use the natural orifices of the patient. In other words, we go through the pain, through the penis or the female urethra into the bladder and then pass telescopes up the ureter either to treat ureteric stones, bladder stones if they're in the bladder, or indeed kidney stones if they're in the kidney. And if the stones are so large that they're Going to be almost impossible to remove all the fragments through the ureter. We may go through the back and perform what's called percutaneous renal surgery. Uh, well, this is the holy grail for all of um, all of the urologists interested in stone disease is prevention of further stones. And rather embarrassingly, despite the fact that we're now in 2024, our understanding of why stones form remains rather poor. We therefore have a rather pragmatic approach to this. Um, we can adopt a number of very complex biochemical tests to try and analyze the stones and find out what is predisposing to patients. But nonetheless, the majority of patients have what we call idiopathic stone disease. In other words, we don't find a cause. And in those, we therefore adopt the pragmatic approach of let's assume that the stones want, the urine wants to form stones and therefore the best approach to reduce that risk is to dilute the urine such that the stones have a less, less of a propensity to congregate and aggregate together. And the way we look at that is not how much you drink, but how much you pee. 
We like the regular production of dilute urine. Um, unfortunately, we do use the wine analogy very often. And if it's if your urine is the color of a Pinot Grigio or a light champagne, then we're happy. Um, if the urine is concentrated and looks like Lucozade or a dark uh, dessert wine, then um, the patient needs to increase their fluid intake to reduce the risk of further stones. And that's probably the most profound advice we can offer. So the regular production of dilute urine. Secondly, we add um, we recommend patients um, can cook with salt, but they don't add it to the food at the table. Salt sucks out calcium into the urine and that predisposes um, to further stone formation. So reduction in salt intake at the table. And finally, a common sense diet. Whilst there's an enormous amount written about high oxalate containing foods, a lot of this is yin and yang and is a good balance. Um, we don't want any extremes of diet. And it is advisable for a, perhaps a good Mediterranean diet to be adopted. Um, and those three are probably the most important factors lifestyle-wise to reduce the risk of more stones.